Sixty years after the Nuremberg Trials, a conference commemorating the living legacy of Robert H. Jackson featured many prominent speakers. Among them included Lieutenant Colonel Michael Newton, a highly sought after speaker on accountability and conduct of hostilities issues. He has been a senior advisor to the United States Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues and has implemented a wide range of policy positions relating to the laws of armed conflict, including U.S. support to accountability, accountability of mechanisms. He has repeatedly taught Iraqi jurists and is active in the effort to establish the Iraqi Special Tribunal, which will soon hear the case of Saddam Hussein. the privilege of introducing Lieutenant Colonel Michael Newton. Colonel Newton earned his JD and LLM degrees from the University of Virginia Law School and he's a member of Virginia Bar. He was the senior advisor to the US ambassador at large for war crimes issues in the Clinton administration and he was deployed to Kosovo to do the forensic field work to support the Milosevic indictment. Colonel Newton helped negotiate the elements of crimes document for the International Criminal Court, and he served as the US representative on the UN Planning Commission for the Sierra Leone Special Court. He served as a member of the International and Operational Law Faculty at the Judges Advocates General's School uh, he's been on the law faculty at West Point Academy and just recently uh, moved over to uh, Vanderbilt University where he is currently a professor. He's the editor of several books and many articles and his title this morning is The Iraqi Special Tribunal, Echoes of Nuremberg. Please join me in welcoming Lieutenant Colonel Michael Newton. Well, I feel welcomed. Um, I must also tell you that I feel honored to, to be with you all to share the stage with these distinguished panels. Uh, you have a wonderful environment and a wonderful collection of people and, of course, a wonderful intellect in the audience. I was impressed with the questions. Uh, my goal is to allow time for questions as well. Uh, this morning, of course, uh, the title of my talk is the Iraqi Special Tribunal Echoes of Nuremberg. Now, the Iraqi Special Tribunal, just, just to set the foundation, is the formal name for the process set up. People want to hone in on the Saddam trial, but it's a much broader process than that. It's the process set up um, almost from the minute that Iraqis had control of their own destiny, they began to talk about, what are we going to do to prosecute the senior Baathists? And the, the answer generated by that process is the, what we call the Iraqi Special Tribunal. All of you, I think, at this point in this audience have read the opening statement at Nuremberg. If you haven't, it's brilliant. It's in a pamphlet on the outside. You should read it. I think it ought to be required reading in every American law school. The, the famous line, of course, is when Justice Jackson says, you know, the line about that four great nations flush with victory uh, and, and uh, stung with energy or injury would stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit uh, they're captive enemies to the judgment of the laws. And here's the ringing part of the line that I think you're seeing in Iraq today. And this is the real echo of Nuremberg. So after I say this, you can go to sleep. Uh, Justice Jackson said that the, the fact that you would submit these enemies to the rule of law is one of the greatest tributes that power has ever played to re reason. It's interesting that now we've turned it around that at the time that was an exceptional event in international politics and in international law today, that's the, the norm. That's what we expect when we talk about the rule of law. And so for the Iraqis to simply say as a people and the politicians with whom I dealt and certainly the judges, one judge said to me, my job is to judge, not to murder. They understand that principle. That's the real echo of Nuremberg. That's the real legacy of Nuremberg, not just in Iraq, but in other post-conflict settings. In Iraq today, and I've been there twice, but I've dealt with Iraqi judges along with Mike in some other settings for a total of maybe five or six times, had extensive hours and hours and hours worth of conversations with them. 
If you go in as a Western lawyer, and of course there's the typical, you know, you're uh, American hegemonic uh, imperialist lawyers, you know, there's that sort of baggage that we carry, and then we deal with them as professionals and as colleagues, and, and we quickly disabuse them, they quickly realize that we, we all share the same objectives, which is the rule of law, and the preservation of the integrity of this body of law. I have seen some, dare I say, American lawyers, go in and puff their chests and sort of pontificate and say, I'm here to teach you about the rule of law. And I saw one young fellow who did this, and an older judge, very respectful, dignified judge, reached in his pocket and he pulled out an old Saddam dinar. Um, of course, on one side is this, this actually rather beautiful picture of Saddam. Um, on the other side, this, this old, dignified Iraqi judge handed this pompous young American lawyer and says, look on the back. And you turn over on the back, and it's the Code of Hammurabi. And he says, we Iraqis know about the rule of law. Hammurabi was an Iraqi. Now, setting aside the slight historical inaccuracies, <laughs> um, you know, the point is they get it. They understand the, the process of law, codes, submission to the rule of law. In this setting, just like they're proud of Hammurabi's legacy, we can be equally proud of Justice Jackson's legacy. We can say Justice Jackson was an American. And dare I say in this setting, Justice Jackson was a New Yorker. You can be particularly proud of that. Um, one of the real echoes of Nuremberg, apart from that basic principle of respect for the rule of law in place of the rule of vengeance, is this. And I, and I want to do this a little bit indirectly by telling you a story from American history. Some of you, and I, I, I beg your indulgence for those who are familiar with the story. When our republic was a brand new republic, we of course were born in the midst of an enormous, complicated, I never was much of a Revolutionary War scholar until I, I lived at West Point, New York, of course, one of the critical sites in the revolutionary struggle. And I became a great avid reader of revolutionary texts. Uh, because you need to really go back and realize what an incredible period that was in our history. John Adams was sent to France to serve as, as the representative of the new American Republic uh, during the war. Now, there's a British blockade. Uh, it was the dead of winter. And of course, in those days, I'm not a sailor, but, but I have been on the water of some. Uh, you know, there's difficult sailing across the North Atlantic in those days in the dead of winter through a British blockade in the middle of the war. John Adams made the strategic choice for the benefit of his son to take his son with him, young John Quincy Adams. John Quincy was 10 years old. The, vo the first voyage across to France, and they did this to, to further the boy's education, to teach him France, to show him the world, to teach him uh, the literature that was there, to expose him to all these things that he needed to learn. The voyage was an incredibly difficult voyage, but they made it, and you know the history. John Adams represented us in, in those environments. They came back, and then John Adams was recalled. And then they faced the dilemma, do we take our young son back with us again? And the boy didn't want to go. He was terrified. Uh, John Quincy Adams was 10. It had been a terrifying voyage. And his mother wrote him a note. Abigail Adams, I think, is one of the great unsung heroes of American history in a lot of ways. Let me read to you what Abigail Adams wrote. And you can hear the echoes of Abigail Adams in Nuremberg. And you can hear the echoes of Abigail Adams in Iraq today. This is what she wrote to her 10-year-old son. The moral of the end of the story, of course, is he went. Um, these are the times in which genius, there are times in which genius would wish to live. It is not in the still calm of life or the repose of a pacific station that great character is formed. The habits of a vigorous mind are formed in contending with difficulties. Great necessities call out great virtues. When a mind is raised and animated by scenes that engage the heart, then those qualities which would otherwise lay dormant wake into life and form the character of the hero and the statesman. This is to her 10-year-old son. And of course, John Quincy Adams went on to become one of our greatest presidents, in my view. Catch the line, though. Here's the significant line. When a mind is raised and animated by scenes that engage the heart, and you see the duality that you saw at Nuremberg that I believe you're seeing in Iraq today. Intellect, mind, commitment, character, 
paired with a heart that's touched. It doesn't just sit back and say, well, what happened happened and there's not much I can do about it. I'm just, I'm just me. Judges in Iraq today, and I'm so glad that Henry King and some of the other prosecutors have been with us because in a way, what Abigail Adams was writing about, they exemplified. In many places around the world today, when we try to get people to leave the comfort of, of their homes, to leave their families, to go engage in these great struggles on behalf of the rule of law. You see, the rule of law is not just an esoteric, intellectual, philosophical debate. It's a hard-won struggle, but you win that struggle on the ground, not in front of your TV. You win that struggle by having a mind and a heart that's dedicated to that struggle. And I think this is really one of the great legacies of Nuremberg that you're seeing in Iraq today, particularly in the context of the Iraq Special Tribunal. It's often been said that life can only be lived forward, but history can only be understood backwards. Uh, the corollary to that is, I quote Henry King a lot, because I love this, being named Newton, of course, it rings true, that the law owes more to Darwin than it does to Newton. And, and, and that's really true. The law evolves. International criminal law as a discipline evolves. That happens only at those friction points, at those fissures, at those, think of it as shifting tectonic plates. By definition, those are periods of great stress and great difficulty and great uncertainty, just like Nuremberg was and the lead up to Nuremberg. That was true in, in Sierra Leone, it was true in the Balkans, and it's true in Iraq today. Enormous uncertainties, enormous pressures, and yet there's a cadre of, of real committed patriots who are dedicated to the rule of law who have stepped into that breach to advance the rule of law. That's not an intellectual philosophical struggle. Their, their lives are in danger. And that's one of the real legacies of Iraq today. People like Henry King and Robert Jackson who left the comforts of home to, to put their words and their deeds where their hearts were. Judges in Iraq today are under great pressure. Their families have fled, many of them. Many of them have been removed from their families. Many of them have been killed. Many of them have been almost killed. I mean, one of my judge friends got a phone call from a neighbor who said, don't go out. They're waiting for you in your apartment building, right in the front. So he called somebody, and they snuck him out the back door along with his family, and he's safe. And then do you resign? Do you say, well, I'm tired of these threats. I can't, I can't support the rule of law anymore. No. If you have the intellect and the heart that Abigail Adams wrote about, you do what this judge did was, and you put on your suit and you go to work the next day. That's happening in Iraq very commonly. You might infer from that, and this is not something that translates easily into a soundbite. The only thing I can assure you on this, and I think Michael Scharf, my good friend, would, would echo me in this, and, and Jeffrey Robertson, and some of the people who have dealt with these judges, is that in fact, these are people, men and women, of great distinction and judicial temperament. These are people who understand the rule of law, who want to get it right. Um, they have, despite the fact that their personal safety and the future of their country is in grave jeopardy, they have a real commitment to the principles of justice and the principles of truth. And therefore, when we sit down and talk to them about the principles of international criminal law, when we talk to them about Nuremberg jurisprudence, when we talk to them about the jurisprudence of the international tribunals, they soak it up. They're eager to learn and then apply. And, dare I say, ask incredibly incisive questions. They're, they're, they're incredibly insightful in that. The second thing that I think that they uh, exemplify the, the, the values of Nuremberg, and there's a real echo of Nuremberg, is in their conception of their role in the world. See, Justice Jackson was, was very aware that what he was doing on behalf of the president and on behalf of the coalition was groundbreaking. It was historic. It was an amazing, and when you just look at the logistics of what they had to do, when you look at the timing, when you look at the, the political dimension of bringing together those prosecu prosecution teams, when you look at the range of decisions they had to make, when you look at the range of evidence that they had to go through, when you look at this just as a, as a prosecutor myself, as a trial lawyer, setting aside the politics of it, think about it as a trial lawyer. 
the enormously difficult prospects of simply the magnitude of that case putting on the trial, it's difficult in itself. Justice Jackson was aware of all these things. But he did it for a reason. He did it because it was the right thing to do and because he had a very clear vision of the future. These Iraqi judges are no different than that. Uh, many times they have said to me, uh, and, and I know they've said to Michael Sharp as well, do you think people will read in 50 or 60 years our opinions the way we read the, Jur the Nuremberg opinions? And of course the answer is, you bet they will. And then the teacher in me takes over and says, that's why we've got to get it right. That's why we have to understand the law, we have to understand the principles, we have to apply them properly, we have to document them properly. That's why these cases are so important because in fact they will be studied in excruciating detail and that's why your opinions have to be so meticulous. That's, those are important principles. Iraqi judges have told me over and over and over again that they view themselves not just in the microcosm of Iraq and, and in their conception, believe it or not, Iraq is a microcosm. You know, Iraq, from our perspective, is the game. From their perspective, Iraq is only the doorway, and one of them said to me, we want this to be the doorway for this body of law to the broader Arab world. And that's pretty ambitious. It's admirable. I believe Justice Jackson had that same mentality when he went to Nuremberg. He wanted to be that, that to be the doorway by which the principles of humanity and the principles of, of law were translated not from rhetoric in classrooms but into practice. The difficulty, of course, that the Iraqi judges face today is that when you talk to them about Erdemovich or you talk to them about Tadic or you talk to them about Baraguiza from the ICTR jurisprudence or Kabanda or some of the ICTR jurisprudence, those opinions are not even in Arabic. And one of the judges said to me, of course, one of the first things that, that happened was there was a contract let to translate those opinions into Arabic because the judge said to me, you know, I should know more about that, de that decision than what I read in a particular brief from a particular side. Yes, you should, judge. Uh, so, so there's an effort underway to translate those decisions. That's why the trial is important, that it will be in Arabic. Uh, Justice Jackson said in closing um, at Nuremberg, he said, we must never forget, and this is a famous quote, you've heard it before, but I think it's particularly relevant in the Iraqi special tribunal context. He said, we must never forget that the record on which we judge these defendants is the record on which history will judge us tomorrow and into the future. The Iraqis today are very, very conscious of that. They want to write opinions. They're not quite sure how to do that in the context of, you know, one of them said to me one time, do we have to write a 200-page opinion? No, you don't, but you've got to write an opinion that captures the law accurately, that lays out the findings of fact, that explains the legal wrinkles that you've had to deal with. One of my favorite quotes in this context comes from Learned Hand, who of course was a, was a peer. Uh, Learned Hand, I, I, I think, is another set of readings that ought to be required reading for law students. They should, they should have a Learned Hand exam before they leave law school. Uh, because there's so much good stuff captured. Here's what Learned Hand said. He said, he was talking about the, the principles of liberty and the principles of justice. He said, liberty is not ruthless, unbridled will. It's not the freedom to do as one likes. That's the denial of liberty, and it leads straight to its overthrow. A society in which men recognize no check upon their freedom soon becomes a so society where freedom is the possession of only a savage few. That's what Nuremberg did for humanity. You know, if you want to know the, the, the articulation of that principle in practice in a society, you go back to the Nuremberg trial records and you read the oath of loyalty that they took to the, to the Fuhrer and the implications of that. That's all documented in those trial records. And that had, a, I think, a historical effect on reminding people, setting the record. This is what happened in a society in which only the savage few had real liberty. The Iraqis are very conscious of that. They understand that the trial record has to be one that documents this. And then the third legacy of Nuremberg that you're seeing in Iraq today is, is really the concept of an independent judiciary. The real concept, in fact, when we gathered uh, the first time I was in Baghdad, we had a group of Iraqi judges, about 96 of them, the first question 
And they weren't shy about questions. You know, they were there, they were thirsty for knowledge. The first question they had was, how do we establish an independent judiciary in a system where, of course, we rely on the political processes for funding, uh, and, and you know, the, the practice of law in the United States through your Justice Department, how does that work? How do we set up an independent judiciary based on constitutional principles based on the rule of law? They're very concerned about that. And they look back to Nuremberg, and of course the, the critiques of Nuremberg that, that point to some of the politics that were behind the scenes at Nuremberg, and they say, we don't want that same kind of critique to be made about our process in the future. We want to have an independent judiciary, not just in the, in the country as a whole, but particularly in this process. And in fact, Article I of the Iraqi Special Tribunal says, we're going to set up a tribunal to prosecute leading Baathists, and it's going to be independent. Article I, first sentence, foundational principle uh, of that process. And as we all recognize, of course, as practitioners, implementing that is an entirely different story. But that model is there, and the vision is there. And this is very important, because As I said, justice is not an abstract concept. Concept, It's real. It's palpable. People understand when they, you know it when you see it. They know what justice is. They know what a, a, a truth-finding process is like. These are people who lived in an environment of, of fear, and they want an environment where the rule of law truly predominates. And that's not, that's, that's not just wishful thinking. They, they, they've put their lives on the line, and they're committed to that and they want to achieve it. To quote Justice Jackson again from a closing statement at Nuremberg, Justice Jackson said, to pass these defendants the poison chalice is to put it to our own lips as well. We must summon such detachment and intellectual integrity to our task that this trial will commend itself to posterity as fulfilling humanity's aspirations to do justice. Independence, impartiality, judges being judges based on facts and evidence and law, the quintessential judicial function. The Iraqis understand that, and they want to have a process that's accepted and credible and respected around the world. They long for that. They long for the legitimacy of, of people and observers around the world to say yes. And it's interesting because, you know, the comment from the earlier panel that the accusatorial model has triumphed in international criminal law. Well, not so fast. In the international tribunals, of course, there's a bit of a backlash against that for a lot of reasons. Uh, the, the accusatorial model in its classic sense has been, has been modified fairly substantially through substantive changes in the rules of procedure over the last few years to make it more inquisitorial, to make trials a little faster, to make them more expeditious. Um, in Iraq, it's actually the other way around. The tribunal process is built on the inquisitorial model and then tweaked, adapted, as necessary to comport with relevant human rights norms and the standards of international criminal law. And that means some importation of accusatorial sorts of practices. Uh, it's a fascinating model. And the Iraqis are very quick to say, this is the only legitimate way to do it because Remember, their commitment is to having a, a, a process that restores the rule of law on a societal level. The necessary prerequisite to that is a sense of legitimacy and acceptance on the part of the Iraqi people. The necessary prerequisite to that, in turn, means, and this is the fact, that this tribunal is built on the bedrock of Iraqi law, Iraqi criminal procedure law, and the statute itself, which has now been passed as an Iraqi domestic law, and then the backdrop of human rights norms and other pieces of international law. Those are brought in where necessary, but the bedrock, the foundation, the practices come from Iraqi law, which raises one, one specific observation I want to make. One of the things in the statute itself that some people have criticized uh, and I've talked a lot with the judges about this, is the requirement that the lead lawyer be an Iraqi lawyer. Well, that, that makes sense on a, on, a, on a superficial level when you say that the rules of procedure are grounded in an Iraqi criminal procedure law, so it makes sense to have somebody who understands those rules. The other thing judges have told me is, 
And remember, they say this in the context of, of not much of a, of a detailed awareness of what's happened in the other tribunals. Uh, those who practice in this field, I think, will readily acknowledge, even the most ardent supporters of other processes internationally will recognize that there's been some ethical problems. There's been some real ethical problems of lawyers practicing in an internationalized setting where it's very difficult to hold them accountable to ethical standards because they're not practicing in their own bar. You can't disbar them. Uh, you can't really censure them. You know, it's, it's been a struggle in other settings. So when I, when I ask these Iraqi judges who are really unaware of the details of what's happened in other tribunals, that's the answer they gave me. We are the judges. By having members of the Iraqi bar, they come from, they call it the Iraqi law on lawyers. They have all been trained in accordance with the Iraqi law on lawyers. They understand the ethical standards. We can hold them ethically to the appropriate standard of representation. And who can argue with that? Because the, the point is that you have a process built on the rule of law and a process that follows, follows judicial forms. And that's why they wrote that into the law. Interesting. Now, behind the scenes, of course, there are many, many other international lawyers, and, and they're perfectly, they, they acknowledge that. And that's perfectly appropriate. But in the courtroom, the lead lawyer will be an Iraqi lawyer governed by the Iraqi law on lawyers, which is, which is very important to them. The other thing that uh, is a legacy of Nuremberg with respect to the function of the judiciary is the concept of elements of crimes. Again, this is, a, this is a, an accusatorial uh, common law for all the practicing lawyers, we understand elements of crimes. The principle is this. When you enter a criminal trial where the presumption is of innocence, as it is under all human rights law, as it is in our Constitution, as it is written into the Iraqi Constitution, the burden is on the government or the prosecution. I speak like a military attorney. I'm a prosecutor. So the burden's on the government or the prosecution to prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt. How do you do that? If you're an independent judiciary, and you're looking at facts and you're looking at evidence that comes in, you measure that against a set established template of international norms. And that's very common. We can break down the elements of crime for any ordinary offense in our own normal civil system. We can say to prove the crime of robbery, here's what you must prove. One, two, three, four, five detailed elements. Nuremberg, they did not have the luxury of having a set template of such elements of these international crimes. So what they did was, in the Office of the Prosecution, they did the functional equivalent of that. They did their best to come up with that, but they had no external assistance. They had no guidance. They had no document. They had nothing to turn to to say, here's what we must prove. To, now what evidence will we use to prove that? That's the procedure by which you try a criminal case. What's happened in the intervening years, of course, is that you've had the body of jurisprudence developed. They had the same problem in the early days of the International Criminal Tribunal in the former Yugoslavia in The Hague. They had no set list of elements. So you can't just swagger in and say to the, to, the, to the panel of judges, you know, I'm the prosecutor, I'm a distinguished prosecutor, and I say they're guilty. So please convict them. You know, in the ICTY, they began to develop elements, and those elements began to show up in judicial opinions. Here are the necessary predicates towards proving this crime under international law. In Iraq today, you've come full circle. And of course, the, the, the necessary intermediate historical set was the elements of crimes document in the International Criminal Court. It's interesting that the, and I, I guess I take for granted that most, most of you realize this, but it's worth pointing out because there may be some that don't. Despite the overarching US political decision in the Clinton administration not to support the ICC, there was also a corollary decision to strongly support the development of elements of crimes and the rules and procedures. So there were really three parallel sets of negotiations at the same time, concurrently, simultaneously. There was one set of negotiations on the larger ICC issues. I wouldn't involve with that because that's not my job. There was a parallel set of negotiations on the rules of evidence and procedure. Not my job. I advised a little bit. It was my job to develop those elements of crimes. And what happened was when those negotiations started, the rest of the world, all the heads sort of swiveled to us and said, well, the Americans wanted elements of crimes to give a, an established template to help constrain uh, overzealous prosecutors, to hold people to the rule of law. What do you have to prove to prove the crime against humanity of persecution? 
And how is that crime different from the war crime of persecution? Those are, you find those things in the elements. Incredibly detailed discussions over the next several years, here's the point. That Elements of Crimes document in the International Criminal Court was accepted by the consensus of every nation state there to include the United States. It today serves as the template, internationally accepted all around the world, for what you have to do to prove that corpus of crimes. Now, in the ICC process, that's important because that then serves as the vehicle that you can import into your domestic implementing legislation in order to make complementarity, uh, to effectuate your complementarity rights. But it also does another important thing. In the Iraq context and in other contexts, when you're doing the same thing, not in the ICC setting, what do we have to do to prove this crime or that crime under international law? What's the difference between this crime against humanity and that crime against humanity, or this form of genocide and that form of genocide? You look to those elements. And those judges have studied those elements exhaustively. And I wish I, I, wish I had a, 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 a graphic file. I wish I had been able to tape. You know, I'm sitting there hours and hours and hours. I'll talk for half an hour, and then I'll field questions for four hours incredibly insightful questions from Iraqi judges who want to get it right, who want to be able to write opinions, as I said, that, that are the doorway of this body of law to the rest of the Arab world, that properly reflect the current corpus of international law. Where is that found? It's found in those elements. And there's some incredibly fine distinctions there. There's some incredibly difficult political compromises that are built in. And so any of you who have done negotiations know that you don't just put a big arrow and say, this is a political compromise. You know, there's some subtle things that are there, some lawyering. The lawyers among you would appreciate those, some, some good lawyering in there. And Iraqi judges, very insightful uh, to, to get into those elements and figure those things out. Now, the last echo of Nuremberg is this. And again, I quote Justice Jackson, uh, April the 13th, 1945 the day after President Roosevelt died. He stood up at the American Society of International Law and he said this. He said, if good faith trials are sought, that's a whole other matter, because the debate was simply executing captured uh, war leaders or, or putting them on trial. He said, I'm not troubled, uh, as some seem to be, over problems of jurisdiction uh, of war criminals or finding existing or recognized law by which standards of guilt may determine. All experience teaches that there are certain things you can't do under the guise of justice. Courts try cases, but cases try courts. And oh, isn't that true in Iraq today? You know, the problem is not the structure of the Iraqi Special Tribunal. On paper, it's a carefully developed, it comports with human rights standards, it comports with the rule of law, it is a brilliantly assembled document between the statute itself, the rules of procedure, and, as I said, the foundation of Iraqi criminal procedure law. All the rights to counsel, you know, the protection against coerce, the presumption of innocence, all the things you would expect to see are all there. The problem is in the doing. You know, Justice Jackson said, courts try cases, but cases try courts. And then he said the following in his speech to the American Society of International Law. He said, you must put no man on trial before anything that is called a court under forms of judicial procedure if you are not willing to see him set freed if not proven guilty. Iraqi judges have asked both Michael Scharf and I, how many defendants were, were not convicted at Nuremberg? What's the acquittal rate in The Hague or in Arusha, Tanzania? And they've made very clear that where the evidence, the burden is not met, that they have every intention of not convicting somebody as one. You know, that's, and that's the context in which the judge said to me, my job is to judge, not to murder. An independent judiciary that builds the rule of law from the ground up. And who can, who can oppose that? I want to close because I want to leave time for questions. I have lots of other things I could say. Maybe I can work some of them in questions. I was struck last night by the comment, because I've heard many of the same things from Iraqi judges, that Nuremberg really was the, the beginning 
the genesis, the roots of democracy in Germany today began at Nuremberg. And in five years, 10 years, 15 years, however long it takes us to understand the process and however long it takes us to work itself through, Iraqis have said the same thing to me, that this trial process, the triumph of the rule of law over the, the political factors, which are, which are enormously complex, over the ethnic factors, over the sectarian factors, this process, what we are doing today, is the genesis of real democracy in Iraq real fundamental freedoms based on the rule of law. And it's inspiring, or it ought to be inspiring to you as it is inspiring to me, that these judges are willing to put their lives on the line for the sake of those principles. And they mean it. They're not just talking about it. They're willing to endanger the lives of their families for the sake of those principles. Now, I have a few minutes for questions. Well, the, uh, the backdrop to that, of course, just to ref so that everybody understands the question was, in the Nuremberg context and in the post-Nuremberg domestic courts of Germany, there were many former Nazis who served, and that served on the domestic level to frustrate. This gets into the entire de complementarity debate. You know, the International Criminal Court is established on the, the bedrock of complementarity, that the best source of justice is that closest to the people. And this was again said last night, that you know, it was really the Auschwitz trials. And this is the way he said it, because it was a German courtroom applying German law with German judges, was what really began to affect the consciousness of the German people after World War II. The hope is that the Iraqi tribunal serves the same process, because it's, a, it's an Iraqi domestic process with Iraqi judges applying Iraqi law supplemented by international law. And there was a lot of supplementation necessary. Um, you know, that's actually been a source of great, the statute, by the way, also says, because uh, you know this, because I, I, I infer it from your question. The statute says that no member of the Ba'athist Party, I believe it's Article 33, uh, will serve in this process. And, and some of the judges have said, that's as it should be, because we need to completely remove any taint of Ba'athist, and that's the, the, the source of their question about the independent judiciary. Um, but some of the others have said to me, well, in fact, one of them said one time, he said, you know how those people were. He said, many judges in Iraq who are dignified men who believe in the rule of law were card-carrying the Ba'athists, and it had nothing to do with their, with their political affiliation. My perspective is this. The best source for figuring out those competing dynamics are the Iraqis themselves. And the Iraqi Special Tribunal Statute is an Iraqi domestic law passed by Iraqis, drafted in large part by Iraqis. If they wanted to change that, they would. And it was just readopted, what, 10 days ago? August 11th. August 11th. And that provision stayed the same. Right? So it's their country. It's their judicial system. If they want to change it, they will. And they may as they, as they begin to move down this process. But for the time being, no members of the Baptist Party, and they've, they've been pretty diligent to filter that out. So who are these judges and how are they selected? Uh, the selection process was, was incredible. And, and believe it or not, I mean, and people don't believe this because they think I have some vested interest, but I don't. I was just an observer. This was not an American process. And one of the things that, that frustrates me a little bit sometimes is people say, well, you know, the Americans have helped the Iraqis. Well, duh. I mean, really. What, what else would we do if we believe in the rule of law, if we believe in restoring, how could we possibly sit back and say, well, figure it out yourselves over the next few years. Of course, we've helped them. But the selection of judges was an Iraqi process. Uh, interestingly, in that very first group of 96 judges and prosecutors, they were the first people in Iraq to see the statute itself. This was in December 2003, uh, four days after Saddam had been captured. In fact, I'll tell you a story if I have time about how they reacted when they heard that Saddam had been captured. Um, some of the most distinguished members of that group, you know, you looked around that group and as you got to know them, you said, well, certainly the Iraqis will pick this person and that person and this person because of their intellect and their, 
you know, their presence and their leadership and all that. None of those people showed up in the final pool of judges, which was surprising to me. And so I did a little homework. I went back and I said, well, what was it that disqualified this judge or that judge or whatever? And, and it was interesting because in many cases, they were disqualified for what we would call conflicts of interest. You know, one of the leading judges who I looked at before I knew the story was the only survivor of nine brothers. And the Iraqi said, great, distinguished intellect, we can't have him on the tribunal. Conflict of interest. Those are the kinds of things they work through on their own. So they come from all over Iraq. Um, most of them have very little or no experience in international criminal law. But I would say that's not unusual. When you look at the judges in other tribunals, that's oftentimes a, de a defining characteristic of those, of those judges. So they have a learning curve. And in that sense, they're no different than a, than a Zambian judge who gets to go work on the ICTR. He's got a lot to learn. So they learn it, and then they apply the law. I have a question. Wait a minute. You've got to get Hussein's reaction to the Hussein capture. Oh, well, look, we're in this room with judges. And, you know, it's a formal, dignified training setting. And they're all, you know, sitting there, and they're all taking notes, and they're asking questions. And a cell phone rings in the back row. And one of the judges sent it. Now, we knew that this had happened, but we didn't want to tell them yet because we, we were waiting for confirmation. As you know, we were waiting for the DNA confirmation. Um, cell phone rings, and the judge jumps to his feet and shouts what's happened, and the room disintegrates. I mean, back patting and slapping and hugging. And this is striking because these are very dignified in that culture. To be a judge in that culture, they're older, they're very dignified, very respectful, very appropriate, and that just disintegrated. They were like children, really. It was the last day of school, you know, just the excitement. What struck me about that, though, was this. I mean, you might expect that, and of course, the AK-47 fire began immediately outside, the celebrations and all of that. What struck me about that was this. One of the judges hugged me, this big bear hug, and this big, tall Iraqi judge, and he says, today is day one. And that's what he meant. He said, today is the first day when we get to really set about building a new Iraq based on the rule of law. Today is day one. So that was their reaction. Mr. King? Yeah. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, I think the big echo uh, of Nuremberg uh, in the Iraqi situation is an allegation that that Saddam Hussein committed aggression. Jackson thought that that was the fundamental crime, at least what I served, mm -hmm. and I was there. <clears throat> now, now, at the same time, the United States has opposed the inclusion of the crime of aggression uh, in the charter for the International Criminal Court, right. although three former Nuremberg prosecutors Myself and Harris, with Whitney Harris and Ben Friends, got have got it in there. How uh, is there a dichotomy there, and uh, will aggression fly? I think it'd be a magnificent step forward for <coughs> international law if we did have see it through. Mm -hmm. I well, that leads me to a larger. What a great question because it gives me the chance to make a larger point, which is this: when you look at the statute. And again, this is a statute produced by Iraqis with American and other, other allies. This is not just an American assistance. Other coalition allies assisted this. It does what you would expect. It builds in all the war crimes, both international and non-international conflicts. It builds in crimes against humanity. It builds in all the genocide offenses. And then the beautiful thing, Article 14, incorporates, much as in the Sierra Leone context, aspects of Iraqi domestic law. And that's where, as you say, the crime of aggression comes from. But there's, a, there's an intermediate step. It's not just the naked crime of aggression drawing back on the Nuremberg context. It's that principle of crimes against peace, as they termed it at Nuremberg, embodied in Iraqi domestic law. So Article 14 says, we can punish crimes committed against Arab neighbors under the force and authority of this piece of Iraqi domestic law. The other two, to me, are also particularly fascinating. And what's important about this is these are, out of the whole universe of things they could have picked from Iraqi domestic law, realize there's, there's you know, 150 or so international crimes. And then the question is, what do we as Iraqis feel like has to be in this statute from Iraqi domestic law? You could have picked 
you know, a thousand things. They pick three. They pick the crime of waging war, or waging aggressive war on an Arab brethren. You know the other two. And this is fascinating, and I ought to tell you all you need to know about the insight that these people brought to this process. The second one is uh, despoiling, wasting the natural resources of Iraq. In other words, stealing from the people. Both, both the oil well fires, the destruction of southern marshes, all of that. The sense that you really overturn the rule of law in Iraq for your own gratification. And then the third, and this is the one they're the most passionate about, is the crime of, of interfering with the independence of the judiciary. These judges are, are, I mean, you want to get them heated up. You start talking about what, what happened in Iraq commonly was not as the common perception is the normal judiciary was corrupted. What happened in Iraq was Saddam would set up revolutionary courts or special courts, they were called, and he would simply say, you, 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 you're three judges, go execute this person. And they'd have a 20-minute trial, they, you know, you know, no judicial training, just go do it. And that's in the Iraqi statute today because the Iraqis demand it. They said, if we're going to have a process that builds the rule of law, we must punish, of course, internationally, where people overturn the rule of law, the, the greatest crime at Nuremberg, but we must also punish this corruption of the judiciary. When it did happen, they are adamant about that. And in fact, some of the first trials will charge that. And so some people might say, well, they're charging some, some picayune provision of, of Iraqi law to the exclusion of all these other sweeping principles of international law. And from my perspective, I would say it's their right to do that. They're the ones that have the best, the best insight into what builds the rule of law long term in Iraq. And therefore, the question of whether they'll charge the aggressive war or not is really up to them. Based on the evidence available and based on the timing and all those things, that's prosecutorial discretion. I think it will ultimately be charged. I'm not sure when. Uh, and I, you know, that's up to them. So. Table in the back. Yeah, I'm, I'm lots of lawyers, so I might sort of miss something here. Um, but you put great emphasis on the rule of law um, throughout the talk. But in the UK, we tend to believe that they, there was no respect for the rule of law with regards to the actual invasion of uh, Iraq. And therefore, isn't it mendacious to try to draw a moral equivalence between what happened at Nuremberg, especially Robert Jackson's role, and what's happening in Iraq? Well, mendacious is a pretty strong word. That's another polite way of saying I'm standing here lying to you. Um, my perspective was from the echoes of Nuremberg in the Iraqi process today. Setting aside the, the we can have a lot of debates, and as we have all over the world, about the onset of the hostilities, the question is, what is the mentality in the tribunal today, and what is its proper role? What should it be? And I just want to tell you correctly, truthfully, it really is centered on restoring the rule of law. Okay? And from their perspective, you've got to understand that the real rule of law in Iraq was not taken away by a coalition invasion. Their perspective was that the real rule of law in, of law in Iraq, Iraq has very good law schools. They have a very well-developed legal structure, complements of the Brits, in, in part. Uh, when you look at Iraqi criminal procedure law, uh, as I have done, you're, you're, I'm amazed. And I see a, there's a Miranda rule built into Iraqi criminal procedure law. All that is there, all of which was overthrown and thrown out and ignored by the regime. So that's their perspective, is the real rule of law was trampled by the regime against the Iraqi people. Our job is to rebuild the rule of law on behalf of the Iraqi people, and they really are committed to that. I'm not just saying that. Um, they really come at it with that perspective. One more question. You mentioned that the Iraqi tribunal could be sort of the basis for the development of uh, democracy in Iraq. But there's another document, the Constitution of Iraq, which mm -hmm. probably a lot of people would say is equally important, right. if not more important. Right. That document seems to be in a great deal of trouble right now because of the ethnic makeup <coughs> of, of the country, particularly the fact that the Sunnis seem to be rejecting it, and right. the Shiites and Kurds seem to be taking advantage of their majority position and relationship with the U.S. In, in creating the structure of that constitution. Um, my question, I guess, it actually goes back to the first question in a way. To what extent are the judges who are part of this Iraqi tribunal representative ethnically of the full mm -hmm. complement 
Yeah. What about Sunnis? Are they in a practical sense? Are they there? Yes. And also, and also, how were they? What was the um, composition of the uh, whatever uh, institution selected those judges? Was it fully representative as well? Well, it was the governing council originally who selected them um, with an awful lot of incredible, and this is wonderful because it's all Iraqi politics. It's all Iraqi domestic politics. It's not, you know, the American viceroy. I love that term, the viceroy, because it implies that Ambassador Bremer was able to sort of sit back on his throne and dictate. That's not what happened. It's an Iraqi domestic po political process. Um, which, which selected these people. So I, don't, I couldn't tell you the precise proportions. Uh, there are Sunnis, there are Shia, there are lots of Kurds, of course. Uh, there are some women, um, which is a big deal. Uh, some women, the, the best one that, that I'm the closest to is an Iraqi uh, 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 Kurd. She's the investigating judge and a very important, very prominent, so they're not just sort of sidelined. They've really got real roles and real responsibility. Um, I guess the best answer is to say, that, that this process will work uh, coextensive with the constitutional structure to work together to build Iraq. And in fact, in a sense, comparatively, this has been on a different timeline, and you might say it's a little healthier in that sense because they've had multiple opportunities and lots of political pressure to simply, you know, there's a school of thought in Iraq that says, look, why do we need all these high, high paid judges in this whole special process? We can prosecute in normal Iraqi courts the crime of murder. Why are we wasting all this? What's the point? Why not just do murder? Why not just do, you know, kidnapping? Why not just do all these other crimes? And the answer is that real commitment to say, we're going to take international principles and be the doorway to the broader Arab world and to the rest of the world in a way that's legitimate and credible. And what I would tell you in distinction to the constitutional structure is that they've had multiple opportunities and a lot of pressure to simply do away with the Iraqi tribunal. And say, look, it's too expensive, it's too slow, you know, too immune from political pressures. You know, we'd like to have politics have a little higher role. So let's just abolish it and get on with trials. And that's been resisted at every step, most recently as of August the 11th, which re-promulgated the statute and made some revisions, some fascinating revisions, as a matter of Iraqi domestic politics. And it's, in some sense, sort of a yin and yang, you know, where you see the rule of law developing here, I think it'll have an effect on strengthening constitutional structures, where you see a constitutional political structure emerge that begins to give you some stability and some sense of political buy-in to the, to the larger system. That also helps secure the political base and the political support for the tribunal. So they, they operate in conjunction with each other. And we'll see. I, I'm actually pretty optimistic um, long, in the long run Remember, we, it took us a long time in our early history to get it right as well. This was not a six-month process in the United States either, or even a two-year process, or even a five-year process. It took a while. Um, but when you're, one of my favorite quotes is a quote that says, when you're steering your ship, you don't, you don't steer by the light of passing ships, you steer by the North Star. And I think they're steering towards the right objectives. So. Thank you. Just